right, hello everyone, uh, welcome. I'm just uh, going to try and get everyone seated here to get started. We're going to have a, a bit of a long uh, business session here today, so I want to get you guys out of here in a reasonable time. Um, so welcome everyone, um, welcome to all the past presidents. We've got a, a number in attendance here and their spouses. Um, so welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for making it out again. Uh, should be a great program this evening. Um, so first off, I'm, I'm just going to uh, introduce the Board of Governors and Executive for this current year. Um, so we've got uh, the Board of Governor, Jacob Huff. Uh, Governor, uh, Richard Cameron is in the back there. Uh, Chris Crawley. Adrian Mitani. Adam Moons. Somewhere here. Um, next up we've got our secretary, Aaron Dobson, and Chris Budge, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight, our treasurer. Uh, our president-elect, Daniel Redmond. Our past president, Abby Saunders. And uh, your current president, that's me. <laughs> Next up, I'm going to get Aaron up here to introduce our guest for the evening. Should be a good list tonight. Yeah, a big list tonight. All right. First of all, thank you to all the guests for being here tonight. Uh, we have Preston Blair, Ahmed Farag, Michael Callahan, Porter Clement, David Eckel, Stephen Menke, Kevin Camp, Scott Ferguson, Chris Harder, Songjin Huang, Daniel D'Souza, George Passion, Ian Wilton, and uh, Rachel Collier. And I'd also like to welcome the, uh, the guests of the past presidents that are here with us tonight. So we have Francine Boyce, Carol Karskallen, Peter Godden, Inga Jesselberger, uh, uh, Lane Menard, Justin Bizeau, and Monica Mahaney. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's great to see so many new faces or old faces returning. Um, I didn't mean to say old faces. <laughs> just, just returning faces. Um, so next up, I'll just uh, quickly give an update uh, on our new members from Salim. the Auto Valley chapter since our last meeting are George Patson, Senab El Abidabi, Afad Azuz, Stephen Mienki, Fafnuti Mikael, Lunita Dunitaspi. Uh, next up, I'll just give you guys an overview of the uh, upcoming uh, summer golf tournament that we do every year. Um, so it'll be Monday, June 4th, uh, noon shotgun, uh, registration about an hour prior. Um, so the spots are currently full for the uh, event, so the uh, way to get in would be to find someone who's got a spot and, and talk to them. Um, there are still some sponsorship opportunities uh, for that event, so if you're interested, reach out to Rod Lansfield at HTS, um, or you can come see any of us on the board and we'll get you in touch. Um, so looking forward to seeing you guys there. Uh, next I'll get uh, Dan up here for a research promotion update. Thank you, Adam. So as many of you know, Azure Research Promotion, the annual campaign, is really the mechanism by which Azure raises funds to further the development of the research that goes into the codes and standards that we use every day and that, frankly, many of us take for granted in our everyday business lives. Uh, as you can see up on the screen, the RP campaign team for the Ottawa Valley chapter has done a phenomenal job this year. We're already at 110% of our goal, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, we're still raffling tickets, though. We're still trying to, to earn a little bit more 
Tonight I am raffling, we actually have two raffles. We're raffling tickets to the Ottawa Red Blacks versus the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the home opener on June the 21st, as well as the second raffle, so you double the chances. Second raffle is for the Ottawa Red Blacks versus the Montreal Alouettes on May the 31st. If you do want to donate to the campaign and you haven't yet, please just throw your hand up in the air, let me know, I will come and find you and uh, make sure that we get that taken care of. Any questions, let me know. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan, and, and thank you to everyone who's continued to know me. I think uh, it says a lot about both uh, Dan for raising such a, a great amount of money and, and for everyone in the room who's donated. Um, definitely a huge part of uh, after research region two and society in general. Um, so thank you everyone. Next up I'll, uh, I'll start off by getting our tabletop displays to come and say a few words about the product. Uh, so the first one being uh, Spartan Bioscience. Um, either Rachel Collier or uh, Chris Harder, if you'd like to come up and say a few quick words about your product. Yeah, <clears throat> I didn't prepare my speech ahead of time, I didn't know we were going to do this, but thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to come. Uh, Spartan Bioscience is basically a local <coughs> company that is <coughs> the Legionella testing space. So what we're doing is uh, we've created a new small technology for being able to test the water inside uh, HVAC and domestic hot water systems. And uh, we're obviously wanting to start close to home. We have a number of collaborations with companies, uh, New York, Toronto, and other places. But ideally, we'd like to uh, have a good relationship with our uh, heating and cooling people here in Ottawa. And uh, we just wanted to showcase our product and get to know you. And if you have any questions about anything, please come see us, and we're more than happy to answer you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So if you have a chance, uh, take some time, maybe afterwards, uh, find the table and go check it out. Um, next up, our theme tonight is history. So Brian Dickinson and Aaron Dobson have uh, got a little thing they want to uh, show off here, our ashtray tabletop for the evening. So uh, tonight the History Tabletop is up at the front here, and we have a collection of photos, chapter minutes, uh, and some uh, ashtray manuals from as far back as the 1950s. So if you are interested, please come and take a look at the, uh, the binders and, and flip through. Uh, would you now like to go through the past presidents? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now I'd like to welcome all of our past presidents to tonight's meeting. Uh, we have 17 past presidents in attendance with us tonight, and as a tradition, I'd like to invite all of our past presidents to come up for a group photo and a champagne toast by Kathy Godin. So, to start, um, we'll uh, start with Abby Saunders, uh, past president 2016 to 2017. <laughs> Steve Moons, past president from 2014 to 2015. Rod Potter, past president from 2013 to 2014. Don Weeks, past president from 2012 to 2013. Christine Kemp. Past president from 2010 to 2011. Patrick St. Elm, past president from 2008 to 2009. Rob LeFay, past president 2007 to 2008. Kathy Godin, past president 2004 to 2005. Past President 2000 to 2001. Pierre de Gagne, Past President 1994 to 1995. 
last century. <laughs> <laughs> Ross McIntyre, past president 1993 to 1994. Yeah, Past president 1991 to 1992. And so we also have a visiting past president uh, from 1991 to 1992. I'd like to invite uh, Daryl Boyce up as well. Uh, Daryl Boyce was the past president of the London chapter and is currently the society treasurer and the incoming president elect. John Dugan up, uh, past president 1986 to 1987. Gabriel Laszlo, past president 1985 to 1986. Dalton McIntyre, past president 1982 to 1979. Rudy Jutzelberger, past president 1974 to 1975. And lastly, George Karskalen, past president 1969 to 1970.
we're in a mutual admiration club. It's a really small club, there's just two of us. I really like the University.
Morrison Hirschfield. <laughs> Total HVAC. <laughs> JP2G. Walmart ventilation. <laughs> and Trey Canada. <laughs> Thanks again to all those organizations for your commitment and support of the chapter to ensure our success and growth. Now we'll move on to the Student Award. This is something that we award annually, recognizing that students are the future of our industry. The Student Award is presented to an ASHRAE student member based on their overall performance and achievement for the award. This award is presented in memory of a, of a past president, and this year's award is presented in memory of Noel Kirby. I'd like to call on Peter Shaw Wood to introduce this year's recipient. Um, all right, let's see. So yeah, this year, um, uh, the student award uh, took a lot of thought from uh, a few people and uh, we came to a good conclusion on it. Um, it's going to go to a gentleman from Carleton University. His name is Harjit Singh. Is he here tonight? I don't see Harjit tonight. That's unfortunate. I know he said he was going to try to make it, but that's uh, has to do that. We'll get to him for sure. But uh, Harjit, um, very, uh, uh, very hardworking gentleman, a long background in chemical engineering and HVAC. Um, he is a graduate student studying engineering at the uh, University of Ottawa currently, which is the joint with the Carleton Engineering Program they have. Uh, he completed his bachelor's degree in technology at the Baba Bandhu Singh and Badur Engineering College in Fatabi, Sabi, India. I think I did that well. <laughs> Over the past two years, he has uh, continually had a good presence at all the African events. Uh, he's been advocating on behalf of our organization to his peers heavily. I know we've done a couple of presentations to a few uh, student uh, classes at uh, Ottawa U. Um, his leadership in that regard has resulted in uh, joint education across the Ottawa U. Fortunately, we weren't able to submit it at the end, which was unfortunate, but uh, you know, they did well. I know the mentor uh, was, was happy with the progress that they made through. But uh, it's a challenging uh, project, that one. The design competition is very uh, arduous. So he did his best, and uh, I was very happy to see what uh, he came up with. But uh, certainly, it's going to be a pleasure to have another charge of this year. Okay, so next award is an award of excellence in honor of two long-standing chapter members who passed away too soon. The Baker Oaks Award of Excellence is presented to acknowledge a member's dedication and outstanding service to the Ottawa Valley chapter. Unfortunately, this year's recipient is unable to attend but they've been a chapter member since 2003, been involved in various capacities at the chapter level, including student activities and CGTC chair, and most recently, a member of the executive. In addition, this year's recipient served a long stint as Board of Governor while representing our chapter at the regional level as RBC CGTC. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to announce the recipient of this year's Alex, excuse me, Baker Oaks Award is Chris Fudge. Our last award this evening is one that's awarded on a five-year cycle in honor of our chapter's anniversary. In recognition of the 65th anniversary of the Ottawa Valley Chapter, the anniversary award is presented to a long-standing member who has contributed much towards the historical and continued success of the chapter. A chapter member since the 1980s and a member of the Telephone Committee, which I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> this, year, this, year, this year's recipient has also been a member of the Board of Governors executive and a long-standing member of the reception and research promotion committees. He was chapter president in 2000 and recipient of the Alloks Award in 2001. 
Many of you will recognize this year's recipient as the first smiling face you see after you register at the desk for each chapter meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating this year's winner of the Anniversary Award, Mike Sweet. so far. Uh, I'm, I'm still in a state of shock, I must say. Um, I just want to thank the chapter very, very much for this award. Uh, I'm just so pleased to see how the chapter is doing, the, uh, the growth of the chapter and the youth coming up behind all the, the veterans. Uh, the chapter is just so strong. It's just so good to see. So uh, once again, thank you very much. Before we do that, I also want to just uh, say hello to uh, Simon Joel and his wife. Uh, forgive me if I get it Hilke. wrong. Hilke? Yes. Um, so, welcome. And so, with that, we'll take a, a brief break, we'll have some dinner, and then we'll uh, reconvene for an evening program. So it seems like we're uh, fairly on track, but before that, we'll also do the uh, installation of the new board. Thank you. Tickets tonight were graciously donated by Donald Weeks of Inner Environmental. So thank you very much, Don. And we are going to do two raffles. So uh, if I could get Dan to come up and uh, draw tickets, and hopefully people at least come into their pockets and found their tickets up. So the first, just so that everybody is aware, the first one that we are drawing for, this is for May the 31st, the Ottawa Red Blacks versus the Montreal Alouettes. And the winning ticket is a blue ticket. Number nine, eight, six, seven, eight, five, four. Oh my god. Anybody? Oh my god. Oh. Ha, ha, ha. 
And it's the fair No? So, again, thank you very much, everybody, for the continued support you make in the performance of the Thank you for everybody who has donated to the campaign, and thank you very much to all of the corporations and individuals like Don Weeks uh, from the mayor who have donated tickets to the Bernie as well. Thanks again. Before I run away, I did that just so that we didn't quite down Before I run away, I will point out that tonight we raised $520 towards the uh, campaign. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, thank you to everyone for supporting me. Um, so, next uh, thing that's going to come up uh, will be the nominations for the incoming board and executive. Um, but before we do that, I, I do just want to take a few minutes just to uh, say thank you to the people involved um, that have made the last year uh, great. So thank you to the board, the executive, all the committee chairs, and all the other volunteers in the room, uh, and not in the room tonight. Um, can always rely on you guys to uh, help get things done at the last minute sometimes when they come up, and uh, keep things running smoothly, so thank you everyone. Um, we had a great program, some uh, great events over the year, great social events. I think a lot of interest from students and the uh, young engineers. Um, so I think that's definitely an encouraging sign. I um, want to say thanks to, uh, a special thanks to Sandy uh, for helping run our chapter and keep everything uh, together. And uh, a special thanks to Abby for always being there to run a last minute question off. <laughs> see how she did things last year or what she did for something. Um, so thank you guys. Um, it's, it's really all of you guys that made last year manageable and, and enjoyable, so thank you. Um, I'd like to end off by saying I, I'm honored to have served as chapter president and to be uh, joining the illustrious group of uh, past presidents in the room. So um, definitely uh, full confidence next year in, in our incoming president, Dan Redmond. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that he'll have a, a great program lined up and he'll keep the chapter running extremely smoothly. So I'd ask that you give him your full support and wish him the best of luck. And uh, thank you again, everyone. Good luck, Dan. Steve Moons to uh, come up and, and talk to you about the uh, nominations, but just before I do, I do want to, uh, you know, point out uh, someone in the room, Bob Kilpatrick, who's been dealing with nominations for quite some time now and done just an excellent job at it. Um, so I do want to just give a personal thanks to Bob, and I think he deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Steve for stepping in and, and filling this role. So, thanks very much, Adam. Um, and I'll reiterate your thanks to Bob. You capably ran the uh, awards and nominations for a number of years, and uh, I think that the number of people who see in the room, the strength of chapter, is very much an indication of the effort that he put into getting the right people in the right roles at the right times. Um, so it's uh, big shoes to fill, but that's why we have both mine and Abby's feet to do it. Thanks, Mike. See, that's why he gets awards. He only laughs at that. <laughs> um, so it is my pleasure tonight to install the new executive and the new boards of governors. Uh, we ran into a bit of a hiccup this year. Unfortunately, Chris Fudge isn't able to continue in his role ascending through the chairs of the chapter. Um, so we had to juggle a few people around, and uh, with the nominating committee's help and uh, Dan's input, I think we have an exceptional group of people who are going to be able to step in and uh, uh, keep the chapter moving forward. So, um, fellow ASHRAE members and guests, as your nominating committee chair, uh, like I said, it's my honor to perform the installation of the executive for the Ottawa Valley Chapter for Society Year 2018-19. 
It's important to remember that uh, ASHRAE is an engineering technical society organized to advance the arts and sciences of the engineering of heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration to serve humanity and to promote a sustainable world. Let's remember that the founding principles of our society is to assist those individuals charged with providing the leadership in the year ahead. The, accomplish, the accomplishments of ASHRAE's objectives are part of the devoted efforts of thousands of members to contribute their time and talent to the activities of the society. Many ASHRAE members who have made substantial contributions to the society are here tonight. The officers and the Board of Governors of this chapter who are about to be installed are accepting a highly important responsibility to serve in the ensuing term of office. You have all elected them to their offices. You also have a responsibility to help them conduct the affairs of this chapter, to make this chapter an effective, an effective contributor to ASHRAE and to its accomplishments and its objectives require the coordinated efforts of all the members of the Ottawa Valley chapter. Participation in chapter and society activities will reward you in your knowledge of the industry and will enhance your professional growth as you serve in the community of this society. As members, it is your responsibility to provide your time and talent to serve when called, to contribute your interest, your ability, your constructive criticism to building a better chapter for the society and for the service of the general public and in our profession. As is true in any organized society, the authority of the direction of the affairs of the society is delegated to the officers of the governors who are elected by the members. And I will now call up to present, install, and invest those who are to serve our chapter for the next society year. For the Office of Chapter President, Dan Redman. Yeah. Dan, the general leadership of the chapter is entrusted to you. You will act as Chair of the Board of Governors, as the Chief Executive Officer, and be part of all committees. As Chief Executive of the chapter, it will be your responsibility to see that the policy directives of the Society and of your Board of Directors are carried out. You are the one to whom the members of the chapter can and will direct their criticisms of the chapter policies and activities regarding the operations of the chapter. The service of the president of the Ottawa Valley chapter carries with it a great honor, a real responsibility, and a lot of hard work. Do you promise to fulfill your duties and responsibilities of your office as specified in the manual of chapter operative operations? And on behalf of the chapter members, I'm very pleased to install you as chapter president and wish you every success in your term of office. For the office of president-elect, I'll call up Aaron Dawson. Aaron, as principal assistant to the president, you will at all times be prepared to assume the duties of the president should the president be unable to attend the chapter or board meetings, and also other such duties as may be delegated to you. Do you promise to fulfill the duties of your office as specified in the manual for chapter operations? Chapter Treasurer, I'll call up Adam Moons. Adam, it will be your duty to prepare the budget, receive all monies, pay authorized all authorized accounts, and give due accounting financially whenever you are called upon. Do you promise to fulfill the duties of your office as detailed in the manual for chapter operations? On behalf of the chapter members, I am pleased to install you in the office of Chapter Treasurer for the Auto Valley Chapter. Office of Chapter Secretary of Ocado, Adrian Matanji. Adrian, it will be your particular responsibility to keep due record of the meetings, attend correspondence, and be an aide to the senior officer of the chapter. Do you promise to fulfill the duties of your office as specified in the manual for chapter operations? Okay. Right, On behalf of the chapter members, it is my pleasure to install you in the Office of Chapter Secretary for the Auto Valley Chapter. Of the board of governors, 
The following chapter members have been elected as governors for the Ottawa Valley Chapter for Society Year 2018-19. Chris Frawley, Jacob Huff, Celine Verbo, Peter Shaw Wood, and Joe Delaval. Governors, because of your demonstrated interest in the activity of society affairs, your fellow members have elected you to represent them on the Board of Governors. It will be your responsibility to meet as a board, to deliberate, and take action on any matters that may come before it. Since the Board of Governors is the governing body of the chapter, it is an honor and a privilege to serve on it. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this activity and install you as the members of the Board of Governors of the Ottawa Valley Chapter. Fellow Ashtray members and guests, this concludes the installation activities. Please join me in welcoming your new chapter executive and remember that they need and deserve your support. Mr. President, give us your cap. And the chapter wishes you the very best of luck. Thank you very much, Steve. Sorry, I just wanted to do that. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Steve, and thank you uh, to the board and the uh, executive that uh, were just sitting out there with me. It is my pleasure and my honor to address you all as the president of the Ottawa Valley Chapter and to welcome everyone here to the last meeting of the 2017-18 Society Year. I always look forward to the main meeting as it is such a wonderful opportunity to reconnect with past presidents and to reflect on the strength and dedication of all of the individuals who have worked and who continue to work to make this chapter so successful. As you saw earlier, we had almost 20 past presidents in attendance tonight, which is fantastic just to keep us connected. As the first order of business, I would like to call upon Adam Graham to come back up to the front. Sorry, we just sent you back to your chair. To officially induct Adam into this prestigious group of past presidents, and to present him with a certificate of our appreciation, as well as his coveted past president's pen. I saw Adam fumbling with this pen, and I thought, how hard can this be? It's just a pen. <laughs> but it's got a different kind of back to it. That's kind of cool. Anyhow, I digress, and uh, we'll, we'll get on with this. Remember, Trump. put in a tremendous effort and did a truly outstanding job of guiding this chapter. Would everyone please join me in another round of applause for everything Adam has done in his heart and soul in the chapter. He has certainly left some very big shoes to fill and hopefully my, my two feet will fit into them. Again, I'm very grateful to stand in front of you tonight. I would not be standing here today if it were not for the support of many people, many of whom are here in this room. I would like to thank all of you who have supported me along the way. I would like to thank the Executive, the Board of Governors, and all of the Committee Chairs and Volunteers that put in countless hours of effort for the benefit of the chapter. Thank you, Rod, for your continued efforts on the website, and thank you, Sandy, for keeping us organized and on track. We in the, very, in the Ottawa Valley chapter, we are very fortunate to have such a vibrant and successful chapter. 
And I think all of you deserve a big thank you. Please join me in a round of applause for all of the volunteers. ASHRAE really is a volunteer-based organization. At all levels, the chapter, the region, the society, everything that ASHRAE becomes comes from volunteer efforts. Adam delighted us last year with uh, his ASHRAE story, and uh, I'd like to put a little bit of light on to how I got involved in ASHRAE. After I joined the chapter, I'd attended several meetings, but uh, it took a little while to get involved. I had several people, the likes of Steve Moon, Steve Lynch, and Chris Fudge, try to coerce me into uh, joining the committee. And for whatever reason, I said, you know, I'll think about it, or maybe later, I, I never really committed. Until I was asked, I was approached, and I was asked if I would help organize a party. And I don't know if it's because I perhaps felt a little bit guilty for not saying yes previously, I had to say yes eventually, but besides, it's a party. Who doesn't like a party? How hard can that be? Well, lo and behold, it, it was a pretty big party. It was a uh, CRC, a chapter regional conference, that I then spent the next two years planning that CRC with Daryl Boyce. It was a big deal, and it was a heck of a lot more than a little party. But you know what? It was a lot of fun. And I really learned that the more that I put into ASHRAE, the more that I get out of ASHRAE. And I implore any of you that are interested in becoming involved to get in touch with me or anybody on the executive or on the board. Because that is really the best way to get involved, to better yourselves, to better your careers, and get more out of ASHRAE. So yes, I, I jumped into this party and I kind of got uh, pushed into the fire so to speak, but uh, that push is what got me involved, and ultimately that push is what uh, ended up with me up here on the stage today. So thank you, Steve, Steve Williams, Steve Lynch, Chris Budge, and Daryl for pushing me. In terms of the year ahead, again, I think we are very fortunate to be part of such a strong chapter, and I want to maintain that strength. We are putting together a program, high-quality meeting topics, seminars, tours, and tech sessions along with networking and social events to keep things fun. Similar to what we've come to expect from the Ottawa Valley chapter, ultimately something of high quality and high value to the membership. And we are also going to continue to look for avenues to collaborate with similar organizations such as the MCA, the OCA, the PEO event that we recently had. All in all, I'm looking forward to the year ahead, and again, I thank you for your support. I'd like to wrap up by thanking all of the past presidents who have built such a strong foundation for us to work with and build upon. Thank you, everybody. Now, moving to the program, I would like to call upon Dan Gosling up to the stage, and that is Dan is coming up. The program this evening is meeting the goals of the Vancouver Declaration on Climate Change in Federal Government Facilities. BGIS is working closely with the Public Services and Procurement Canada to implement aggressive measures to reduce the environmental impact of facilities owned by the federal government across the country. In addition to discussing the approach and the challenges related to the mandate, this presentation will focus on the importance of relationships, communication, and collaboration between all stakeholders to achieve aggressive greenhouse gas emission reductions while maintaining long-term fiscal responsibility. Daniel Goslin is the National Director of Energy for BGIS, and during his 17-year career, he has specialized in the execution of capital projects, including the delivery of practical sustainability solutions, including lead design, lead is in uh, sustainability, not lead. Well, I guess we've probably done a bit of both. <laughs> and head construction services. More specifically, Daniel has successfully led teams in the delivery of deep energy retrofit projects, primarily focused on HVAC. As national director on the RV1 Federal Government Facility Management Contract, Daniel oversees a team of energy managers, energy engineers, and architects. His primary mandate is to work closely with the PSPC to achieve carbon neutrality in their facilities across the country by 2030. No small task. 
Thank you very much, Daniel. Just give me a moment, I'll get the computer booted up and then we'll be able to get started.
country was, uh, or federal government, I should say, is reducing by 30% uh, emissions uh, from all sources uh, by 2030. Uh, and that's been extended, that's now been gone, they've gone to a longer, uh, a longer program, which is 80% by 2050. And part of that is, is uh, because they realize that just with some changes that happened in the grid um, over the last um, you know, five to 10 years, specifically in Ontario, um, a lot of the emission reductions have happened since 2005. So just in Ontario, uh, you know, the, the, the emissions have been, because the, the coal power plants are no longer uh, working um, because we, we've been very good at conservation and switching to other fuels, um, we've been able to reduce quite a bit. So the, the long-term goal is, is um, by 2050. What we're trying to do at PSPC, however, which is our client, I'll tell you a little bit more about what BGIS does for the client. The PSPC, as a, as a, a department in the government, is trying to achieve carbon neutrality in our facilities by 2030. So a very, very ambitious target. And the purpose of that is because we want to draw the roadmap for the rest of the government to be able to follow. So I go to the next slide just to tell you a little bit more about what it is that we do. So you know, being in Ottawa, uh, many of you have engaged with BGIS and PSBC, and we're all connected somehow, some way to the federal government. It's, it's really the engine of our of our city. So what uh, what BGIS does is for for PSBC is really the facility management side of things. And this contract is really bigger than anything I've ever seen. So there's actually six different contracts, one for Pacific, one for Western Canada, one for Ontario, one for Ottawa Gatineau, and then another one which is in Ottawa, which is just Carlin Canvas and Tunney's Pasture. Then there's one for Quebec, and then one for Atlantic Canada. So what does that mean? That means we oversee the management of more than 5 million square meters, square meters, so 50,000 square feet. Uh, on behalf of the government, that's least and known. And of that, there's about uh, 3 million uh, square meters, which is actual uh, property that's owned by the Crown, and that we are operating on a day-to-day -day basis. We have about 1,800 team members uh, involved across the country. So it's, it's bigger than anything I've ever, ever seen. Uh, my job, uh, uh, just to give you a little bit more scope as well, it's a seven-year contract, we're in our fourth year, and then there's an option to renew uh, for six more years in total. So it could be a total of 13 years uh, in terms of contract. So it's a, it's a long-term engagement. It's definitely a, a marriage of sorts. Um, what it is that I do uh, as the National Director of Energy, and, and my scope of, of responsibilities has evolved a little bit over time. I'm now more uh, responsible for all, as well as energy, is, is professional services, which is a team of engineers and architects that support the technical side uh, Specifically, the planning. You can imagine the, that we have, you know, with this, this year we have new net new projects, under million dollars, so mostly maintenance projects. We have 1,500 projects across the country, and there's another thousand that are already on the go that started the year before. So the, the volume is incredible. So we have a team of, of engineers and architects that helps with the planning side of that, so that at the end of the day we can provide proper scopes of work, so consultants can then uh, understand what it is that we're trying to de to, to deliver. Uh, and then obviously then it goes on to the contractors and suppliers and that's, that's been a challenge is to really be able to, to, to speak to what we do. But on the energy side, um, we started off, and I started off two years ago, we had a team of 13 across the country and when these ambitious goals came out we said, well, we, we can do this, but we need more people. So we've been able to grow the team to 30 across the country. Uh, and we're, for those of you who are working with it, we're, we're, it's, a, it's a bright team that's very, very engaged and very, very hands-on. And I'm going to talk a lot about the, the relationships and the purpose uh, that we have uh, in building those relationships. So what do we do? Uh, basically, we work with BGIS, works with PSPC, uh, and we also have NRCAN that feeds into us as well. And we're trying to support all the federal departments. And the first federal department is PSPC. We're trying to serve them to uh, really draw the roadmap with respect to how to achieve carbon neutrality. So PSPC developed, and this came out about a year ago, it's called the Carbon Neutral Portfolio Plan. So the Carbon Neutral Portfolio Plan is really a roadmap with respect to how to achieve at a macro level, what do we need to do at a macro level across the entire country to achieve this carbon neutrality. So this, this has really helped us to focus our efforts on the right things. So the first thing you'll see on the, uh, on the left, 
uh, number one is really the emissions 2005 2006 compared to 10 years later and the big difference there is really because the Ontario grid has gotten much cleaner uh, although this is a national contract uh, half of the portfolio is in Ottawa Gatineau so a lot of the emissions are coming from from the Ottawa area and the Ottawa electrical grid so a lot of the emissions have come down actually because the Ottawa the Ontario electrical grid is improved um, and then as you go these are things that are really within the PSPC's control that we are more reactive to. So they divest buildings, uh, they decide to uh, densify their population in their buildings. So we, they, they believe that they, um, are, we, we all believe that there will be emission reductions there. Where BGIS kind of lives is more on the project side, the retrofit side. And the biggest bar there about in the middle is about negative 26%. It says deep retrofits. And we believe that the, the deep retrofits are actually going to be um, more than uh, than the 26 percent because really, if you look at all the other measures, they're all really interconnected together. And so, deep retrofits. I'll talk a little bit more about what they are, but they're basically you know, re-engineering the entire HVAC and lighting systems um, to maximize GHG reductions. And then on the number four is, you know, at the end of the day, we're still going to be using energy. We're still going to be some emissions from that energy. And uh, the plan is for PSPC to uh, purchase outside of the BGIS contract to, um, to to procure renewable energy, um, and they want it, want it to be net new energy that's going to be on the grid, not just buy you know energy from a certain uh, hydropower plant. So they're actually going to be engaging so that new uh, renewable energy is put onto the grid, uh, hopefully at a community level, uh, close to where the buildings are. Uh, and then the last one is, is uh, offsets, so they're looking at things like uh, buying renewable uh, natural gas, which is really means you know, grabbing the methane from a dump and putting it into the, the, the gas pipeline. So they're, trying to, they're going to be trying to change the, the infrastructure as well. And to get to carbon neutral, that's what we'll need to do because we can't do it just at the building level. The other thing that PSBC developed, and we, we helped them out with this, was the methodology. It's really about telling us how, how, what are, the, what are, the, what is the sandbox that we're going to play in to reduce emissions? And this gave the rules for everyone, and including the people who hold the money, the people who are, are running the assets uh, on the client side, as well as on our, on our side. And this is now part of our contract. So, when we talk about multidisciplinary projects. Uh, that's a project where, um, I don't know, is anyone involved with uh, Lester B. Pearson? There's a major retrofit happening at Lester B. Pearson. Oh yeah, we got one right there. So, um, so this is a project where they've got mid-life refit. The building is, you know, it's, it's, it's great exactly the age, but usually, you know, the 40, 50 year old buildings. And they really need a whole revamp. And in those projects, what we've, uh, what we've been told to do is to do studies that look at four options. One is the minimum performance, which is the minimum per, uh, uh, government per performance, which is essentially the, the National Energy Code for buildings, for a new building. Um, the next one is, let's do everything we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as long as it's got a, a it's, it's cost neutral over 25 years. So we look at life cycle costing of the different options, and if it's, if it's equivalent to the first option, over 25 years, even though the capital might be much more, uh, we're allowed to, uh, to to consider that one. The third option is really the maximum GHG. So that's the one where we, we, we just forget everything about payback. We just put everything we could possibly put into that building to maximize the greenhouse gas emissions. And that's been, that's been a real shift in thinking um, because we don't really think about things that are a thousand year payback or never have a payback. The reason they, they and I've come around to thinking it, the reason we want to explore this is because there's new technologies out there and the, the, the government wants us to make sure that we haven't left any stones unturned, that we've considered everything, and that if they want the option to try something new, to experiment with something new, that they can. They've got the option there to say yes or no. And then the fourth option is what we call the hybrid option, and that, that is ultimately what we call the recommended, recommended option. And what we're doing there is really the consultant, the BGIS, the stakeholders from the client, we're sitting down together, we're looking at all these options we looked at and say, what really makes sense? And what we're finding is that so that usually ends up being between that 25 year life set costing and the maximum. So we look at things where maybe 
a little bit of an incremental cost will bring us a lot of a lot of benefit. So we're and, and there's no clear rule for that because they want us to be creative with our recommendations. For single disciplinary projects, um, that is, you know, just replacing equipment, replace, uh, uh, repairing equipment. Again, there, what we've been asked to do is to select the option that maximizes greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, is cost neutral over 25 years. So it, it's a really sh big shift in how we think, and it allows us to invest, to think much more long term in terms of uh, of investments. And I think when it comes to real estate, especially institutional real estate which is going to be owned for a very, very long time, it's the right thing to do. It's, it's the right way to spend your money. So this project here, um, the Arthur Media Building, 25 St. Clair in Toronto, this is a, a really important project for us, not even from the perspective of technology or delivery, but simply because it got funded. So this is the first project where uh, PSBC, they, they actually did the study themselves, this, this carbon neutral study. And we were all kind of holding our breath, going to see, well, what's Treasury Board going to do? And they said, no, we're going to go with the maximum greenhouse gas emission savings. And we're looking at probably about uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, reduction in, in emissions. And uh, it's got a premium uh, capital cost of about 10 to 15 percent. So it's not astronomical. Astronomical. When you're talking about spending 120, 130 million dollars on, on a building, spending another 15 million dollars to do the right thing is, is, is uh, you know, I would say it's insignificant, but it's it's relatively uh, feasible. What we're the reason we we're so excited here is because it was the first time that we saw um, really money flowing through for these really ambitious projects, and we're re really excited because. Um, coming down the pipe, we're hoping that Lester B. Pearson will also get the similar uh, approval. Uh, 875 Heron, also in Ottawa, will hopefully get uh, approval. Uh, and we're also looking at Brook Claxton, which are all projects that are in the mid lake refit. We're hoping that these will get approval uh, in the near future. So, just to give you a sense in terms of uh, what what the, light, what the impact is on life cycle cost of typical maximum greenhouse gas emission savings. Uh, with the Arthur Megan building, is it's, it's an increase of $13 million over 25 years. But you can see that there's a, a very big difference from the minimum design in terms of performance uh, compared to life cycle costing neutral of 25 years. Uh, and you know that's where you really see the big jump and then uh, an incremental improvement with the, uh, the maximum. So what's really interesting to me is that if you're looking at a 25 year life cycle cost, there's no reason why can't get um, very good performance, long-term performance. And this is with conservative numbers with respect to future energy costs, which are you know, unpredictable at best. Um, so we're seeing that there's, there's real, real value here of not just looking at what is your initial capital cost, which is often in our industry what uh, we end up looking at for our asked to look at. So what are our short-term targets? What's our status? So BGIS, when we looked at all of these things that were coming at us, we had to we needed a plan for how to how to attack the problem. Because the client looks at us saying, okay, will you manage uh, PSBC specific about 320 build, build, uh, buildings, about uh, 2.7 million square meters. So how do you how do you go about that? There's just so much information. So what we did is we identified quickly that. Of those 320 buildings, 50 buildings were responsible for 75% of the emissions. So obviously, those are the larger buildings. Those are the buildings in uh, grids where we have higher emissions from, uh, from electricity. So in Atlantic Canada and in Western Canada, we have a lot of emissions from the electrical grids. So those, those are very high carbon uh, emission buildings, and we need to focus on those. Also in Ottawa, we have some very, very large buildings uh, with uh, high emissions from either the plants or from, uh, from burning natural gas. So we decided we're going to focus on those. And what we did as well is we said, okay, well, there's this carbon neutral goal of 2030. But 2030 is far down the road. You can kick that can and just keep planning and planning and planning forever. So what we said is we said, this is a target. We don't have a KPI or anything related to this. But we told the government, we said, we're going to try to get 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from your buildings, completed at least the measures put in place 
by March 31, 2021. Why March 31? It's because the government fight fiscal cycle is March to March. So that's that's our short-term goal. That's what we're trying to do. And we're currently planning for it. And by implementing these carbon neutral projects, it's going to bring us close to that. And by the end of this fiscal year, we'll have a very clear roadmap of how to get there. And we'll be able to, um, to, to ask very clear, for very clear funding to achieve those targets. So what are we doing? Currently, we're doing 43 studies across the country that are either completed or are in progress. And some of you I know are involved with those. So these studies are where you're looking at the four options that we're talking about. So the minimum design, the 25-year life cycle costing, the maximum greenhouse gas emissions, and the hybrid solution. So we're, we're doing 43 studies that are currently on the go. Um, I, we proposed about 40 studies last year uh, to our client. We expected to get 10 or 15 approved. And they came back and surprised us and approved them all. So it's, it's been, you know, every time we, we push the envelope, they come back and they say, no, we really want to do this. Um, the next step will be now that in this coming year, in addition to the projects that I, I mentioned earlier that are in mid like free fit, um, we're going to be proposing more projects that are in buildings that are currently occupied that aren't planned for, for mid like free fit. And that's going to be another interesting challenge to see um, whether or not um, uh, there's going to be that appetite to, um, to invest the money. So we're, we're targeting those high GHG buildings uh, with carbon neutral studies. We're also doing all of our projects now with a 25 year life cycle costing. So over time, all of those buildings where we're doing capital repairs and replacements, um, those buildings will continuously get uh, more efficient. We're also tapping into uh, uh, PSPC smart building technology. So they've been installing a fault detection system across the country. We're starting to leverage that to improve our operations. Where I think the real value is going to be is going to be when we do a lot of these retrofit build uh, projects. We'll have a system that helps us monitor uh, what we're doing and how to do it. Uh, and then the last one is optimize operations. And this is this is one of the things I like about being on the facility management side. What I like is that we are part of the original planning. We're part of the project de development, project delivery, construction, commissioning, as well as operations. So we are now working. We have committees in our top emitting buildings with our operations team machines, our operators, people on the front line who have to inherit these systems that we give them. And we're engaging with them to, uh, to really get their input and to get their feedback and to prepare them for what's coming down the pipe. And I'll talk a little bit more about that integration and the relationship side of things. This, uh, this pie chart represents 100% of the emissions from uh, PSPC's portfolio. And what you can see in green is the representation of all the studies that we're, with all the GHG that we are currently studying to um, to eliminate. The great part is the buildings that are on the disposal list, so we're not actually spending any time there because they're going to get rid of those buildings. And then the white part is the is what's left. So by the end of this year, we'll have you know more than 50% of it studied, and then uh, by the end of the following year, we'll be um, we'll be far quite far ahead in terms of having most of it all studied. And we'll have a very good roadmap. Uh, and even if the funding doesn't come up right away, uh, we'll have a very good plan moving forward uh, as, the, as the projects and the, and the funding comes through. So how do we scale this? Um, I've, I've worked on, on several individual projects, um, also worked on programs uh, on the campus at the University of Ottawa where we do uh, one project or two projects at a time with very good success. But what we're trying to do now is scale it at a Massive, at a massive rate, something that's not, not been done. And for those of you who are, for all of us who are in the industry, we know that there's a lot of places where there can be challenges. And what, what I found is that the challenges aren't really technical. The technology isn't that complicated. What's challenging, and it's not that it's not kind of complicated, we've got really smart people who are able to design and execute these, the technology. The challenge is on the communication side, and often coming from the owner in terms of what do we want. So the steps that we're doing is we're, we're doing these studies, but the really important part is that we're not just telling consultants, you know, give me a carbon neutral study and you know, figure it out. We're, we've developed a very comprehensive scope of work. Um, and the reason for that is just really to make sure that everybody knows exactly what it is that we're looking for. 
providing some technical oversight around the scope of work so that there isn't anything that's ambiguous or left for interpretation. We've also been hiring consultants based on a qualifications-based process. So the 90% of the evaluation for selection is technical uh, qualifications. The last 10% is on the financial side. So we're not we're, we're trying to take away the fact that uh, a low bidder may have few, too few hours to do this type of uh, property. The, the next thing is the collaborative relationships. We are really establishing a relationship where no one is working in silo. At, at the table, we have our team of energy managers with the consultant, and we ask that those relationships be very, very close, that those that communication be very, very close. And the reason is because we want to make sure that you're getting the information you need from us, the customer, and that when you're, you're having to make assumptions or make decisions, that you're telling us up front so that we don't have any surprises. And then that way we can all communicate well to our client um, what's going on and what the results are. And we're finding that by expressing our desire to have these collaborative relationships, we are um, able to better establish relationships. Uh, a big part of the problems that we've encountered in the past um, were caused by us because we're not communicating well what we need. And then we'll complain about the outcome, but really at the end of the day, we're not communicating well what we need. What we're trying to do is correct that, is to provide a better communication with respect to our needs. So we're doing the studies right now, and I've already tapped into, into what we were saying, you know, what I was saying earlier. The reason I talk about failure is not an option. Is the elephant in the room is that um, there's a lot of studies uh, and design projects, but let's start with studies, that end up on a shelf, and they just end up being a check mark, something that we're supposed to do. And you know, it gets paid, and we've got a report, and it's somewhere sitting on someone's desk. In this case, because we're talking about a significant amount of money, and you know, just the studies this year, we've spent probably close to $8 million across the country. Um, so we've got a lot of people looking at these. So we need together to, to have a good result. And when I say together, I'm talking about that, um, that relationship between the consultant, the uh, facility manager, us, um, BGIS, as well as our client representatives, so the people who work with us closely on the energy side, We've all got our reputation on the line. We all need to do really good work because we want this work to keep going. Um, so I talked a little bit about uh, you know, the, the need for all those things. And we've developed what's called a, a process flow. And I, I won't show you the whole flow chart. Uh, I know Patrick's a big fan of the flow chart. It's, it's massive. <laughs> but basically what it is, it, it maps out every single step that we go through in a project. And the part that we've really added is that we found that you know if we get a, a report at 33% or at 66% or sometimes at 99%, unfortunately sometimes we find that the project, the, the engineering group maybe have gone off on a tangent or maybe they didn't have the right assumption because we didn't give them the right information. And then it's a very unpleasant conversation to have um, when you know, you've got hundreds of hours that has been spent. So what we do is we have checkpoints where we check what we call micro deliverables that feed into the reports, just to make sure that everyone's got the right information, that we all agree on everything, so that we together uh, jump off the cliff together um, to, get, to get the result. And that's that's the, the big part of what, what we're trying to do. And although it gets a bit onerous at times because there's a lot of checks and a lot of communication, we find that it's saving us time, it's saving us headaches down the road because we intercept things before uh, going too far. And when the information is not there, we all agree on the assumption we make and why, and uh, we can defend it uh, to whoever we need. So a little bit of background. Last year, uh, and I, I'm moving towards slides about this year's projects, but I don't have all the data. It's not all the <coughs> center, but we did um, about an additional 105 energy studies. Um, and that includes energy audits, um, recommissioning studies, infrared scans of buildings. Uh, and that feeds into our, our, uh, our capital planning for this year. We also implemented about 200 projects last year, mostly low-hanging fruit, because we're planning all the big stuff. Um, so more than 100 uh, projects where we did LED retrofits, so really relamping projects. You know, it's, it's nice that that technology now is here and it's, it works and we, we can just implement it uh, without too many concerns about the long-term uh, long implications because it, the business case is really there. Uh, 
other stuff is to things like VFDs and control projects and whatnot. Here on the operations side, I talked about it a little bit before, and the importance of integration with operations is absolutely essential. We tend to, and this is even inside BGS, it's, it's, it's a default where we, we all get siloed into what we do. We do capital planning, or we do project delivery, or we do um, you know, operations. What we're trying to do now is, throughout these studies, we are having the operations team at the table, we're having the commissions team at the table, property managers, uh, owner investors, people who hold the, the, the strings of the, the money. Um, all those different people are at the table when we're doing this so that they're aware of the decisions that we're making. But more specifically, specifically with the operations team, as, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, is we have uh, committees that are built within each uh, building where we're talking about what can we do to improve the operations, the current operations. And the purpose is to improve the operations, but it's also to engage with them, to listen to them, to get their input into all these crazy projects we want to do because they're going to inherit them and they're going to get all the headaches that come along with them. Um, so we're using them, 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 working with them to get input, to monitor, to leverage the smart building fault protection system, and to continuously optimize the systems. And, and it, it's an essential part of what we do. And it's, essentially, it's essential uh, for the long-term savings. And what I want to see is I want to see projects that are going to be delivered, that are successful, and then that in five years down the road, they are, they are still successful. So if, if any one person leaves, any one uh, uh, one element of the project leaves, the, the building continues to operate the way it is so that it just becomes part of the integrated part process uh, moving forward. Risk management. So this is, this is where I spend a lot of my time thinking. So the risk comes at first from us not understanding what our operational challenges are with the building. Now, are we always um, correcting the same problem? Are we always having the same problem? What systems don't work for us and why? And once we understand what our problems are, then we can have, we can engage with consultants to get good detailed audits and studies. And again, engage them with the right information so that we get the right results. So the next step is integrated design. Uh, integrated design is where we're headed next. We're actually working on an RFP right now to do this. And it's going to follow the same, uh, the same process that we're currently following, which is really about having uh, a qualifications-based selection process, about building very strong relationships with our consultants and all the stakeholders, um, as well as, um, and this is a really important one for me as well, is that the consultants are going to be asked to and hopefully also the contractors and, and the other people involved to stay on on board with the project for 12 to 24 months afterwards. Once you leave a project, uh, it's, it's always like remember my the days when I was a consultant. It, it was always unfortunate that you walked away and you didn't really understand what happened after, just because everybody ran out of money and you needed to keep going. We think that it's very important that the consulting world and the contracting world stay engaged with the projects afterwards to work with the operators to improve the projects, but also to learn about what's worked and what's not worked. So again, it's that full cycle so that there is a continuous um, uh, relationship. So high quality construction and commissioning work, and then the optimized operations, which is going to start with that, continuing that handoff off, a very slow uh, uh, handoff from, from the consulting contracting to operations, and then that continuous um, time working together. Where are we right now? We're at implementation. So I'd say we're kind of at that second fish. And you, can, you can't see it so well, but the third fish has a, a look of, of bewilderment uh, and confusion. And I know that we're going to be hitting that wall um, frequently. And I would actually say that the process is really um, this, this slide but multiplied by 10, 15, 20 times. We need to continuously be doing this. Every time we make a leap, we land into the other bowl and then we need to take another leap to the next bowl. You know, right now this first bowl is, you know, getting the roadmap uh, figured out. The next one is going to be, you know, getting the designs figured out. Then it's going to be construction. And these are all big leaps. And like I mentioned, it's, it's all about scaling it. 
and then I'm going to I'm going to repeat myself again. Scaling it, and the way we're going to do it is with collaboration, with working in teams, integrated teams, and really integrated teams, and to make sure we get the results. Now, in terms of what are we actually doing? Everyone wants to know what technologies are we using. Well, we're finding with the the, the early stages of the the, test, uh, of the the studies we're doing, there's there aren't really many surprises. 75% of the GHG savings in our buildings can happen with technology that already exists, that is already um, very well understood, and um, and can can readily be designed. So what are we talking about? You know, start with a good outlook. We're finding, especially with our old buildings that are envelopes are leaking. You know, it's not, the insulation is not our biggest problem. It's just, it's just they're leaking. So if we need to fix that, that's going to be a big part of what we're going to do. LED lighting, I know it's not exciting, but you know, it's a no-brainer. You got to do it. Then we need to move to dedicated outdoor air systems. So we need to move less air in the buildings. We need a hydronic system. Again, it's not new engineering. It's just Makes sense. I'm not going to explain what dedicated outdoor air systems are because I expect most people here to know that. Uh, energy recovery on uh, the ventilation side, so heat wheels. And then energy recovery from internal loads, so heat pumps. Heat pumps are our best friends to make sure that we're moving the energy around within the building uh, to make sure that we're not heating and cooling at, uh, at the same time. Not rocket science again, but we have tons of buildings that are heating and cooling at the same time, middle of winter. We're rejecting heat when we're also heating the perimeter. Optimized building automation system. So building automation systems with computing power we have, we can really have some very advanced algorithms to optimize the systems. And then now we're also going to be start moving towards predictive systems that look at weather, uh, weather patterns, and also as well as occupancy to determine where we should and shouldn't be uh, ventilating systems or heating or cooling systems. Um, the other technology that keeps coming back, and this is especially due to our, our climate, is a uh, geo-exchange system. So a geo-exchange system, though, is you have to be very careful about what are we going to call a geo-exchange system. If we try to do a geo-exchange system for the peak load of cooling and peak load of heating, the costs are going to be astronomical. What we're finding is by doing a hybrid system, which is really a system that optimizes your base load of heating and cooling, uh, and then you do your peaks with traditional techniques like you know, gas-fired boilers and, and cooling towers, you can get uh, probably two-thirds to three-quarters of the savings that you're looking for. And that is really the sweet spot that, uh, that you need <coughs> to be finding. Um, otherwise, it's just not cost-effective. And then solar panels. So the cost of solar has come down quite a bit. There's also quite a few incentives out there. Um, so we're putting solar just about everywhere. Um, where we're focusing mostly, though, where you know, if I had a choice in terms of, uh, of where I'm going to put them, it's in Western Canada, where the electrical grid is very, very dirty, as well as Atlantic Canada. Um, but you know, it also makes sense because it, you know, if you look at like a straight ROI, you're looking at you know 15 years. So when I mean, you're talking about a 25 year life cycle cost, it actually helps bring your life cycle cost down and it allows you to do other technologies. So those, those are the things that, with those, I think, eight or nine technologies, we can get to 75% of the reductions that we're looking for. Where the last 25% is, the last 25% is where we start looking at really moonshot technologies. And we're looking at all of those. They're not always cost effective. Um, but we are looking at those to make sure that we're, 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 we're checking off all the boxes. Well, not just checking off all the boxes, to really look at all the options to make sure we're aware of everything that's out there. So what's, what does that mean? What are moonshots? So moonshots um, are things like uh, battery storage. So is there an opportunity to you know, use relatively GHG-free uh, electricity at night in Ontario uh, to offset your peak during the day? We're even looking at carbon sequestration. We haven't found yet that there was a, uh, an opportunity yet at the, uh, the, uh, the facility uh, scale. They're looking more at industrial, but we, we keep keeping an eye on that until at some point the technology will be available. 
So uh, then we're looking at uh, translucent PVs. We're doing double skin walls with PVs. So this is traditional uh, uh, methods, but used in a non-traditional way, which is, you know, we don't have a lot of buildings that have double skins, or where we have solar panels all over the, the glazing. We're also looking at glass that tints itself depending on, on uh, the solar uh, uh, the solar heat king in the time of year. Green roofs are also something we're considering. Not so much. Uh, there's other technologies that we can use for to insulate buildings properly. But there's other sustainability goals that PSVC is also trying to achieve. So we're looking at whether or not those um, a green roof type of technology can, can help both with the greenhouse gas emissions uh, as well as you know, providing other sustainability and benefits. Hydrogen fuel cells, we're studying those as well right now. The cost effectiveness is still not there at the, at the facility, facility level. But I think it's just really a question of continuing to, to develop the technology until it becomes uh, feasible uh, at a facility, facility level. Also very important is to tie into existing district energy systems. So if we have excess energy from our building, extra, excess heat, well let's put it back into a district energy system to uh, reduce the load at the plants. Um, the other thing is to, to we're looking at, you know, if you've got a lot of land and you can, we can make a geo exchange system that's much larger than sharing some of that energy to neighboring buildings. And then uh, maximizing PV, just putting it absolutely everywhere, every piece of land, every every available surface uh, that faces the sun, we're looking at uh, doing that as well. And renewable biomass is uh, <coughs> one of the last ones that we're looking at right now. It's still, we're not still not finding solutions that are cost effective, uh, but again, we're, we continue to look at all these different options to to see if we can we can implement. And even um, uh, renewable, I'm uh, sorry, I'm still talking about renewable biomass. Even looking at uh, Runner River uh, hydroelectric. And um, because, you know, as you know, many of the buildings we have are along the rivers, and we're trying to see if maybe there's an opportunity there. And vertical wind. And then lastly, is there's a program called BCIP, the Building Canada Innovation Program, which is a program that's uh, run by the government, uh, where they allow uh, suppliers, manufacturers, what new technologies that aren't really marketed yet, um, they become uh, technologies that are available to test in the facility. So we're looking at uh, testing many of these products in the buildings to really try to, to, to leapfrog uh, the technology and make them more marketable. That covers pretty much everything that we're that we've been working on. As you can see from a technological point of view, even the stuff that we're calling moonshots isn't isn't you know isn't crazy. There isn't a widget out there that's going to just suddenly remove the amount of GHG that we're emitting from our buildings. It's really a systems approach that we need to take, and it's really a, a, an approach where we are optimizing everything we're doing and that we're working really closely together. Because on any one given project. There can be hundreds, if not thousands of people directly and indirectly involved. And all that communication is where things tend to break down. So that's the, uh, the, the extent of my presentation. Um, just wondering if there's any questions related to um, what I talked about today. Yeah? Um, I noted this, but I didn't see any mention of micro or about your scale of the or sort of traditional approaches. Have you guys looked at that? So micro, uh, so cogeneration with uh, natural gas boilers kind of thing? Like if you're doing heating with natural gas and, uh, yeah, or sorry, uh, doing electricity with natural with uh, natural gas generators and, uh, and heating with, uh, with the, the reject heat? Yeah, basically, I mean, in areas where you find the grid is in this thing is to play, you can make power on, say, And so we haven't we haven't looked at that much. Um, we, we are looking at it with, with respect to biomass. We're we're really the government's really pushing to get off fossil fuels altogether as much as possible. Um, so that hasn't been uh, one of the technologies that we're looking at. Um, the other reason is because the they have committed by 2025 to having all clean electricity, which means that they'll whatever we can uh, can't reduce to conservation measures um, that they will actually. Um, 
pay for renewable energy to quickly put back to the grid. Anything else? Yeah. I wanted to ask about the, these GHG initiatives. Are they working to solve down into the smaller project level now too? Or are we still on the small stuff now? Mm -hmm. you know, the fit ups and such. Is, is there money that's going to be available for initiatives at, at that sort of level? Um, yes. And the, uh, we're using a different approach, which is, uh, you know, instead of going through the complex um, methodology, we're actually just saying anything that has a 25 year uh, cost neutral, bicycle cost neutral, um, to reduce the GHG, we can, we, can, we can invest that additional capital. So I mean, that goes from fit ups to, um, to, you know, replacing a boiler, to replacing a chiller, to replacing a cooling tower. Uh, in your life cycle of costing, I think you mentioned that you're assuming uh, an increase in fuel costs mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years. Are you putting a price on carbon as well? Yeah, so we are we are taking into account the price of carbon in, uh, in everything we're doing right now. Um, some of it's already built in, but yeah, we, we, are, we are considering that as well. It's, it's actually not, it's actually a pretty small number. It doesn't have a material impact on the results at this point yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just wondering, like, you know, obviously uh, the grids seem to be all provincially dependent, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Ontario gets a green light because we have no coal anymore, but lots of nuclear. But then you have Quebec and, and Manitoba that have a lot of hydro, and therefore less GHG. Is there any thought to um, to to transmitting power across the country from from provinces that have uh, low GHG hydroelectricity to others that, that may have um, higher GHG components of electricity? Um, I think I would think that that is being discussed. Unfortunately, the facility side of things, we're, we're not controlling that. And we're, not per, you know, we're not involved in those conversations. We're really stuck at the sort of the footprint of our, of our buildings. Um, I think there is a lot of talk right now, and, and just recently in Ontario. There's a new agreement where there's going to be uh, some new transmission lines uh, to to move energy from from both from one grid to the other at different times of year. Um, is there a coherent plan? I, I don't know. I really don't know. Anything else? Right. Yeah, thanks for hanging around. I know it's uh, later in the evening, so I appreciate it. Dan, I mean, the glimpse into the roadmap for what we're doing to try and achieve carbon neutrality, I mean, it's no small feat by any means, and uh, I think it's impressive just to see, you know, the plan of how we get there. Um, before you go, though, I would like to uh, present you with a token of our appreciation, which is a gift from the Royal Canadian Mint, and uh, thank you again so much for your presentation. Everybody that is here will be receiving a survey, and I would very much appreciate if you could fill in that survey. The information that we get back from that survey, as well as from the, the program survey that was sent out last week, really is very instrumental in helping us to make sure that we're, well, we continue to deliver a program that is of interest and of value to all of you. So again, please uh, take the time to complete that survey. And otherwise, that's it for the 2017-2018 Ashray Ottawa Valley Chapter Year. I hope everybody has a safe and fantastic summer, and I very much look forward to seeing you all here again in September. Thank you very much, everybody.